Um, do you know where I was a year ago today? I mean, where? 20 years ago today, 20 years ago today, I was in LA. I was having a meeting with the mayor's office on creating a community based violence prevention program. Uh -huh. And the irony was that the meeting was supposed to be on September 11th. And I had flown in in the morning of um, September 10th and the meeting was in the afternoon. Um, we were supposed to fly in the morning of September 11th. And the flight I was originally gonna be booked on was the flight that left um, Dallas, I believe, and, and, and struck the country. Yeah. Oh, that is an irony. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> now that, you know, we're 20 years, uh, where, where were you on 9-11, 2001? I, when the first plane struck the tower, I had just come back from the gym and I was in the hotel room getting ready to go to the airport. By the time I got to the airport, a plane, the third plane hit the Pentagon and I'd been traveling with a bunch of law enforcement people and we all looked at each other saying, yeah, they're going to shut down the airspace. So we left the airport and went back to our hotel and rebooked our rooms, which was lucky because they closed the airport shortly afterwards. And, um, and then everyone came rushing back to the hotel. Yeah. So I spent the next four or five days, obviously waiting to see when we could get back home because we were all living in that hotel on Century Boulevard. Oh, well, I was actually in Washington. Huh. Uh, we were supposed to meet president, the president that day. So uh, we had about 10 Muslim political organizations get all uh, together uh, and we're walking to the White House at around 9 a.m. Somebody said, oh, the." when the twin, uh, one of the Twin Towers in New York was, was attacked. And we thought, well, maybe it was just an accident. And then we went to the National Press Club and watched the monitors there. And we saw the second plane hit uh, that second tower. And we knew that after that, life would be different. And yeah. obviously the meeting was canceled. Uh, the president actually met with us uh, two, two weeks afterwards. And he made a he made a promise which he which he upheld and he said that you know he would not use any religious terms to describe al qaeda because that would give it uh, legitimacy it doesn't deserve and uh, we worked with uh, uh, secretary chertoff later on to develop that policy that we shouldn't be using religious terminology in explaining or in describing these uh, you know al qaeda or isis so anyway, to, you know, that's where we were on 9-11. And, and obviously, you know, we were trying to get a political appointment uh, to get a Muslim into the White House, into the administration. And uh, it didn't happen, uh, but uh, here we are 20 years later. Here we are. And you know, I think about, we've, you and I have developed not only a strong working relationship, but a friendship over those years and it's 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 interesting because i think i was on a very different path professionally i left government a few years earlier i had created my own company um <clears throat> and i was i thought i was done with government and you know obviously september 11th changed my career path substantially um and I think it's been a tough 20 years, but there's also been things that have occurred that I'm really grateful for. And I think, you know, my friendship and working relationship with you is one of those things. And I think as a society, we've had to take on some pretty tough questions. And I think 9-11 and the years that follow have brought some things to the surface um, that we need to confront as a nation. <clears throat> and I think we're still on that journey. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it comes out though. You know, it's, it's, Sometimes I feel optimistic and sometimes I get really concerned, particularly yeah. when I'm looking at what's taking place online and just the hatred that is spewed online. I think so. that's, you know, I, I, I actually don't, don't go on social media that much. I just follow news um, and developments there. But yeah, it's so toxic and it's a different world. It's, it, it's disconnected from reality. Um, but you know what I like about you, you, know, you John, and and your work in particular, um, 
is that you have an interest in both community-based programming and government uh, policy work. And you try to connect the two. I don't think there are that many people in government that do that. And so I just wanted you to explain to our audience what, what led you to that, why, why you, you feel that's important and what, uh, what you feel some of the highlights and some of the not, not so great things that have happened uh, with that uh, approach. Okay, definitely. That sounds great. And how did you, did you want me, I mean, do you want to just start in a conversation? I mean, I think we're actually, actually this- We actually started. We started about five minutes ago. We're, we're in conversation. Oh, okay, good, great. <laughs> um, so I think the answer to your question is that, um, that I, my focus on community-based approach comes primarily from my early part of my career where I served as a police officer in working uh, as a patrol officer in Gardena uh, and then later a part of federal task forces looking at uh, drugs and violent crime across Los Angeles County, Orange County, Riverside County. And I, I, I was what I learned in that during that time period was that while there was a lot that law enforcement could do to protect people uh, and, and, and serve the public by investigating and seeking to prevent violent crime, that at the end of the day where the most success could be achieved was at the community level. And if law enforcement on the one hand didn't have the trust uh, and the support uh, and, the sense of, and a sense of partnership with local community members, and at the same time, didn't recognize that there are just times that violence can, violent, violence can be best addressed by community members, then they weren't going to be successful. I mean, I think an example that stands out to me is, you know, while I work patrol at lunchtime, um, our chief sent us to local schools. Uh, we're having an increase in violence and increase in gang violence. And we went to local schools, uh, particularly during lunchtime and at dismissal. And what was interesting about that for me was not so much because I walked around in my uniform and I was the police officer, but I got to spend time talking to the kids. I got to spend time learning about their lives. I got to spend time um, understanding what it was like to be a teenager in South Central LA. Uh, and it, it really was educational for me because it gave me insight to how violent crime and, and, and violence that's occurring in the community impacts the lives of people. And that not, not only helped as we sought to reduce violence in the schools, but it also had an impact when I would later come into contact with those same people you know, in the middle of the night um, while handling calls for service or dealing with, with gang incidents. So that's an experience that just stayed with me throughout my various jobs, whether it's working in a governor's office or working in the, in the executive office of the president uh, or, uh, or uh, in, um, uh, in DHS. Um, so what are some things that I think didn't go so well? Um, I, I think that's an important question. I would say as I look back at my last tenure at DHS, one of the things that we could have done better was our are the implementation of our whole countering violent extremism approach. Um, it, was, it was an approach created with good intentions, but I think a flawed understanding of both the dynamics of the threat um, and, a, um, and an underappreciation uh, of the amount of distrust that existed between, in particular, uh, the Arab American and Muslim American community uh, and government and law enforcement in particular. And I think if we would have had the same level of, you know, an analytic based understanding of the threat dynamics back then, I think we would have designed the program a little bit differently. So, I, you know, a big part of what we're doing today um, as we have adjusted um, our approach to be much more consistent with what MPAC back in the you know, in, in 2012, 2013 had been suggesting we, where we should be focusing um, more of a public health community-based approach to, to violence prevention. Um, I think that we would be 
our efforts today would would be uh, more widely accepted and our efforts today would would be entering into the environment with a more trusting relationship so we're spending a lot of effort and i think it's good effort to regain and rebuild that trust um, and in some cases establish it for the first time um, with key communities, immigrant communities, communities of color, the Arab American and Muslim community. Yeah, and there are two aspects to that, um, that that I wanted to explore with you. The first is this notion of prevention. Um, everybody wants to prevent violence. I mean, I think you ask any, any person, they say, of course, if, if we can prevent it from happening, even in our uh, biblical and Quranic texts. Um, it says that you should prevent a harm. It's, it's more important than promoting a social benefit. So uh, we have the Department of Homeland Security responsible for preventing terrorism. Is, is that realistic? I mean, you know, we, we're, we're, are, we, are we giving the public a false sense uh, of, of security or of false expectation? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I come to this, again, having spent 35 now plus years in law enforcement and homeland security, I have come to believe that when the community and government comes together with a common understanding of a problem that's impacting that community, and a common uh, willingness to address that problem in a holistic way, <clears throat> you can do incredible things. I mean, there are examples, plenty of examples where, um, where law enforcement and, and community members have come together to deal with really complicated problems impacting communities. And I can also say that over the course of the last 20 years, I can point to a number of instances where uh, whether it was, um, you know, the intelligence community or the military or law enforcement or even community members uh, have come together to prevent attacks. I mean, every time, um, you know, a, a family member or a member of the community makes the hard choice to uh, pick up the phone and notify local authorities about somebody who's exhibiting suspicious activities, and the investigation of those activities results in uh, an attack being stopped. Um, I, I think that's a success. But I take your point. I mean, I think it's impossible. I think there's two, two issues your point makes. One, it's impossible to prevent everything. We should do everything we can to prevent what we can, but there are gonna be instances where attacks do occur. So people have to be prepared in the, in the, in the potential, you know, have to be prepared in the event that they happen to be at a place where a mass shooting um, or some other type of attack occurs. And we can't let our focus on prevention allow us to, in some respects, do more harm to society because we perpetuate discriminatory uh, or other practices that are inconsistent with the ideals that they uh, form the foundation for what this country is supposed to be all about. You know, we shouldn't be racially profiling people. Um, we shouldn't be profiling um, or having uh, investigative activities driven strictly by the, the faith uh, or the religion that's practiced by an individual or a group in, a group in our society. Um, we, we shouldn't be engaging in activities like enhanced interrogation or activities that uh, violate you know core fundamental principles like due process. So you know people always talk about it as a balance, right? You have to balance privacy and civil liberties, and you you know with preventing attacks. I actually don't believe it's a balance. I think we have to. Do, it's a dual imperative. We have to do everything we can to do both. We have to do everything we can to protect our communities and work with community members to prevent acts of violence, particularly those that are targeting those communities. And secondly, we have to do everything we can to protect. Um, privacy and, and, and constitutional rights that are afforded to every American uh, in this country. I, I think you're on mute. Keep, yeah, thank you. Uh, that, that leads us to the second uh, question. And, and 
you alluded to it in terms of discriminatory tendencies and it's cultural, it's not just in terms of policy. So right now, white supremacist violence is considered to be the, you know, the major uh, threat uh, to our national security. I believe uh, uh, the secretary uh, has talked about it. Uh, and, and so you have that. However, when it comes to uh, the threats uh, of Middle Eastern extremists or Muslim extremists, that, is, that still has a lot more gravity. It still has a much more profound effect on people's fears and even hysteria in our society. How can we, how can we change that um, so that you know, a, a terrorist is a terrorist? It doesn't matter what background he or she is from. Yeah, I mean, part part of the challenge, and I, and I actually think this is a false challenge, um, to be honest with you. Part of what people will point to is they'll say, well, there's there's a, a chargeable offense under federal law for international terrorism, but there's no chargeable offense under uh, federal law for domestic terrorism. Um, you know, yes, that's true. Um, I do not fully believe that that infringes on our ability to conduct investigations and prevent attacks, whether it's by an international, someone associated with international terrorism or someone who is inspired by domestic violent extremist beliefs. Um, but your, your question actually points to a bigger issue. Um, I think one of the responsibilities we have in law enforcement uh, and in, in homeland security and intelligence is to be able to accurately um, accurately describe the threat environment and describe um, events that occur in a precise and rational and objective way so that it makes sense to the public. And then second, and I think this has become more, in the 20 years that I have been involved in government and homeland security, I don't think I've ever seen what I'm about to describe as bad as we have it today is politics and, and the polarized nature of political debate as it's become today shouldn't be influencing how we view threats. So I think part of the issue is that, um, you know, the first question you hear or the first um, assessment one asks is when you have a mass casualty attack is, is it terrorism or not, right? And more typically, if they can, if they can um, connect a violent act to an individual's, you know, at, you know, being connected with a with an international terrorist group or with a foreign terrorist ideology, they they immediately jump to that. This is an act of terrorism. Whereas if somebody walks in and does the same thing at the same place, uh, and it's unclear what um, their motivation was, or they have a blend of motivations, or they tend to have a domestic violent extremist organization, there seems to be reticence about identifying it as terrorism. From my perspective, and this again comes from my local police background, it, it doesn't matter from a law enforcement perspective. We need to be able to understand the threat environment. We need to be able to um, take steps to prevent acts of violence associated with, consistent with that threat environment. Uh, and we need to be able to speak to the public in a clear and precise way with regard to what has happened um, and, and, and what we're doing to address future events of that nature. But at the same time, I understand how my, my way of thinking about it um, doesn't necessarily address the, the, the response within specific communities, like for example, the Muslim American community and the Arab, the Arab American community, when an individual can walk into a, a, a Jewish, uh, day school and gun down people um, as a result of their white supremacist belief, and it's it's called a mass shooting. Um, and if somebody of um, you know who, who uh, of Arab American descent did it, it would be described as terrorism. I mean that's that's hurtful, um, and it doesn't help us establish the the communicate establish and maintain the communication the trust with with one element of our community who, as you pointed out earlier, uh, is, 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 is potentially being targeted today by individuals who hold domestic extremist beliefs. So, you know, there's the answer I can give you as a practitioner, which is, hey, look, 
you know, our responsibility is to prevent these types of violence, um, regardless of the motivation. And as you know, because we've been working closely on this for well over 10 years, that's where we are focused at the department and that's where law enforcement is typically focused. But the way we do talk about these issues, whether it's in the media or societally or even politically, it does matter. And, and I just, you know, one of you another thing I, you know you asked me earlier what are some of the things I'm disappointed about one of the things I'm just in addition to what I said earlier I have a high level of disappointment today regarding how even how we talk about threats has become has been become sucked in and subject to the political polarization that is so pervasive across our country yeah and and, and even the way we, we talk about foreign terrorism and domestic terrorism you you can have an American Muslim born in America, but he's put under a foreign terrorist investigation. Um, why, why is that? Why can't we just have everything under domestic if it is domestic? And now you have so-called domestic terrorists who have transnational connections from New Zealand to Norway to, right. you know, to Europe uh, and, and wherever. So how can, we, how can we reconcile what is perceived at least from our community as, a, as that double standard? So, I mean, you, you raise a really good question. So, you know, if we look at it, here's how we're looking at it at the department. And, and well, let me back up for a second. Part of the challenge with the current threat environment is that it does not necessarily fit into predetermined definitional categories. And from a law enforcement and intelligence community perspective, that is really a challenge for many, right? Because the way they operate is, oh, this is a foreign terrorist threat. This is a domestic terror threat. Um, this is, you know, this is a transnational organized crime activity. But we we crave, you know, our my community, my profession craves structure. We we want it in definitional categories. The problem is the current threat doesn't fit into neat definitional categories. And what do I mean by that? So today, the primary terrorism-related threat faced in the United States comes from individuals or small groups of individuals who self-connect with a ideological cause or a blend of ideological causes or a blend of ideological causes and personal grievances. They acquire that connection primarily by consuming material online. They typically have a very... Um, a, a, a very superficial understanding of those ideological beliefs they're connecting with. And they typically do not communicate or coordinate with members of an organization, whether it be a foreign terrorist organization or a domestic terror organization before going out and conducting a lethal attack. So they formulate a series of grievance and ideological connections. To your point, in some places they may seem contradictory, right? Where we've seen individuals who who adopted both a white supremacist and a and an ideological belief system, of, um, you know, that we typically see with people associated with Al Qaeda and and ICE and or ISIS, but then they go out and they conduct an attack, and and that does not fit a neat definitional box that that intelligence and law enforcement officials are are used to working within. Where it also makes a difference is when someone comes to the attention of, the, of a JTTF, for example, um, they may not meet the definitional characteristics or the investigative threshold for a JTTF investigation. Yet, we've had several examples where individuals who came to the attention of a Joint Terrorism Task Force were looked at, were deemed not to meet the threshold, only to have them go out and conduct a mass casualty attack. So the answer to part of your question is we need to think we and it's beginning to and it is beginning to happen in large part because of some really good analysis that's been done by the behavioral analysis unit at the FBI, by the U.S. Secret Service. We're beginning to educate law enforcement and intelligence professionals that the threat of today may not meet the neat definitional boxes that you're used to, to putting threat, the, the, placing threats into context. And then secondly, how we in how we investigate threats and how we talk about threats needs to take into the 
to take into account what I just described. So when you hear me talk about it and the Department of Homeland Security talk about it, we tend to be wordy but precise in that in, in how we're describing it for the very reason that you raised. The, the, the threat today is very different than the one we faced on September 11th. The, it, it's, a, it's a threat that may not be best addressed using solely the approach that we've put in place post September 11th from a counterterrorism perspective. And it's a threat that does not meet a neat, the neat definitional boxes um, defi that, that, that um, have defined past terrorism related or national security related threats. So that's part of the challenge we're dealing with. And I think the only other thing that I would say is that this is, you know, because of all of these challenges that I've described, um, this is why it's so important that my office, whether it's the counterterrorism coordinator or the work that I do leading the, the department's intelligence operations, we work so co closely with our privacy office, our civil rights and civil liberties office. Um, and we, we, at least since January, have really tried to expand um, our interactions with groups like MPAC and with others in, in the Arab American and Muslim American community, with the Jewish community, with the, with the Christian community, with law, state and local law enforcement, and describe the threat as I've just described it to you. Um, because I think it's important both from an operational perspective and from a messaging perspective, we owe it to people to be as precise as we can in describing the threat. Um, and, 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 and we look forward to continuing that conversation. And, and I applaud you, John, for having that, uh, that sense of engagement that you, you know, that you feel is important uh, in your policy work. It's very rare uh, from my 30 plus years of uh, working with government officials to find people like you. So we value that and we wanna continue the conversation. Um, we have a few minutes left, maybe five minutes. Uh, and, and I wanna talk about the silver lining uh, after 9-11. Um, and here's a statement from somebody on Facebook. Susan, Susan Fisher said, good morning, gentlemen. I was in DC for a meeting a doorman and I stood on the sidewalk moments after the Pentagon was hit, wondering if the bits of matter flying through the air were papers of parts or parts of human. I knew instances of kindness that day and the next from strangers which have never been matched in my life, all the way from the doorman to DC police to the staff of the Smithsonian who applauded for everyone who entered on the 12th. And, um, you know, you have literally mil millions of stories like that. Uh, I remember, you know, uh, on that day, I received a flood of calls, including people calls from LAPD asking if we're okay. Um, and if there's any need for extra security uh, around our mosque. And um, uh, calls from Japanese Americans who warned the country not to think even about another episode of internment uh, of a community. Um, Jews and Christians who wanted to have um, uh, open uh, doors, uh, who opened their doors for us and who came to our mosques. You know, that's the greatness of America, I believe. That, that, that's our America, which is the in inclusive America, not the exclusive America. And the partnership with law enforcement in particular, uh, I, I think carried us through uh, in a significant way. Um, and it really speaks to all, all the great elements and good people within law enforcement. Of, of course, you know, we have incidents uh, that um, involving police brutality that we're dealing with, but there are a lot of good people in law enforcement. And I want you to speak to, you know, how you as a law enforcement official look at communities and and why that partnership is important and and maybe highlight a few um, good things, you know, throughout your experience uh, in law enforcement. I mean, it, it's, to me, it's very simple that as a law enforcement professional, your responsibility, well, let me go back and tell you. So I, when I was a young police officer, um, I was, I was uh, in, a, in a car with a training officer. He was a 30 plus year veteran, very sort of hardened. Um, and he said, so rookie, why'd you become a police officer? So I sort of, you know, went into the, the answers that they teach you in the academy about, you know, 
sense of service and you know and wanting to enforce the law and he says wrong he said you become a police officer because there are some in our society who need your help there are some in the, your society some in society who need protection from you know the dangers of society and you are here for them and if you are not serving the community if you don't if you don't understand that you are there for the community, then you will never be successful as a police officer. And, you know, if you were to not, not to be sort of stere you know, drawn to stereotypes, but if you would have seen this guy walking down the street, no one would have thought that that would have been his views. They would have viewed him as sort of this hardcore knuckle dragging police officer, but he felt very strongly about it. Um, and I have found throughout my career you know, as a police officer, you know, you not only have to understand a community, but you have to want to communicate and you want to be there to be a part of solutions to the problems that are facing communities. I mean, this, this sounds, I think this is a, a type of story that a lot of cops who have worked in the inner city have had, but some of the things that have the biggest impacts on me is talking to a mom who's concerned about her kids and whether they can play in the front yard, uh, you know, in South Central, um, or, and, you know, sleeping in the bathtub because of gang violence. Um, and, you know, those are the things that have stuck with me through my career. Um, as you know, back in, I think, the 2012 timeframe, we put together the faith-based advisory group at DHS. Uh, and we brought together leaders from across, across, the, um, across the, the country, from different faith communities. And what I found we brought the group together primarily to provide a, a platform for us to share information with all of you and for us to receive information from all of you. And I think from that perspective, it was, it was very much a worthy process. But what, I, what really affected me and impacted me was not so much the communications and the conversations we had, but the, the many times when problems arose in communities and the faith leaders came together as a collective and went to those communities on their own and sought to bring together you know, Muslims and Jews and Christians to make things better in that community. And to me, that was so powerful. In fact, I have told people, I mean, I'm proud of a lot of things that I've been able to do throughout my career. I think working with all of you on that group is one of the things that I'm most proud of over my 35 years, because I saw the power that comes when we come together and we're unified and we, and we, and we, we work together to make things better in a community. And, you know, like I said, I mean, my responsibility is to understand the threats facing the country uh, and to um, make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to protect our communities from those threats. And there's nothing I can do successfully if I'm not effectively engaged with members of the community, nothing. And we value that, John. And, and uh, uh, I, I remember being in some of those meetings and I saw you and I, and I was asking myself, you know, why are you, just, why are you wasting your time with us? <laughs> but you, uh, but you had you had a plan, you had a vision, and it was correct. And and we obviously we wanted a seat at the table, and you created that seat at the table for for American Muslims, and and we appreciate that. And we hope that more American Muslims can move up the ranks of our government because we feel that that representation is not just a matter of you know we want a, we want a piece of the pie, but we feel that it will help our policy making. It will help bridge. Um, that, that misunderstanding, it will help, um, you know, develop nuance so that we, we can navigate these contours uh, of these very difficult terrain when it comes to terrorism and religion and religious fundamentalism and, and people using the religious veneer uh, for violence. So we value that relationship uh, very much and, and, and we hope to continue that uh, with you. Uh, you are you're, you're now under secretary for intelligence and analysis. You're still the, the, chief, the top uh, counterterrorism coordinator. Are you doing both right now or? Yes, I'm both the counterterrorism coordinator and I'm the acting, um, essentially the acting under secretary of INA. 
Well, uh, you have a very busy, bu busy uh, life, I'm sure, uh, along with your family and that I know you, you care very deeply about and you care about our country. Um, I also feel that the, the relationships we built um, between yourself and myself as a microcosm between law enforcement and the American Muslim community was a, uh, was a message to Al-Qaeda, ISIS, white supremacists, all those who wanna do us harm that we are united and that our country um, is gonna reject any ideology that attempts to divide us and, and, and so hatred uh, throughout our society. I think that's the silver lining. That's the main lesson uh, of 9-11 is that our, our response, even though may, may, you know, some of the surveillance issues, as you, as you mentioned, some of the mistakes that were made, it, it was hurtful, but the overall response is that we were united. And I think that's carrying us uh, to this day and, and hopefully forward uh, beyond today. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, and look, I think there might be some folks listening or watching this and thinking, well, you know, he he's an he's a civil rights advocate or John Cohen, you know, he, he doesn't really understand operations. I am I have spent 35 years in law enforcement or homeland security operations. I've put a lot of people in jail. I have, I worked on, I've been on SWAT teams and I've run counterterrorism operations. And sometimes I find it funny because I, I oftentimes will be as strong an advocate for community-based partnerships between law enforcement and community groups, um, the importance of outreach to uh, diverse, the diverse communities that make this this country just a great place, uh, and our need to protect the constitutional rights afforded to all Americans. I'm sometimes as, as strong an advocate as our own civil rights and civil liberties officers, because, because again, I recognize that if we don't do those things well, if, we're, if there's even a perception we're being discriminatory, there's even a perception we're, we're, uh, you know, we're not um, carrying out our responsibilities in an objective, manner, um, the people will not trust us. And if there's not trust, they won't communicate. And if they don't communicate, we can't work together to protect our communities. So I think I agree with you. In a, in a almost perverse way, the silver lining from 9-11 was how the country came together. And I think as we are 20 years out from 9-11, we need to recapture that spirit of Unify of unity uh, and common purpose, and maybe ratchet down a little bit the uh, the anger in our pol political system, um, because we have some complex issues we still need to address together, uh, and and we can only do it when we when we address those problems together. Well, thank you, thank you, John. Those are uh, well stated words. Uh... And I appreciate the time, value your eloquence, your thoughtfulness, and your passion uh, in, in doing your work. It, it takes uh, a lot of effort to just get through day, day to day, you know, with all the stories that we hear about. And, um, and we, we value the partnership with you, John, and, uh, and look forward to working with you even more closely together uh, after today. So thank you very much for the time you, you spent with us. Thank you. Look forward to talking again soon. All right, you take care. Bye. Bye.